Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy, and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. My guest this week is Judy Smith, who is a crisis manager extraordinaire, a fixer, a woman who has handled everybody from President George Bush Sr. to Monica Lewinsky to modern day celebrities. She's the woman whose company you call when you're in trouble, I guess. Um, Welcome, Judy Smith. Thank you. I mean, does that make your mission to cover up the bad stuff? (laughs) No, actually, it's not. (laughs) I know when people think of crisis, right, like, who we're, you know, we're hiding something. But really, it's it's not the case, honestly. Um, I enjoy a lot about crisis management, and um, oftentimes... You know, you find yourselves in situations where, you know, people can be at a very rough spot in their lives. And so the ability to help them navigate that, right, and figure out a strategy and a, and a, a plan to walk through that path, that's an that's a honor. It's a privilege. Because you've written for ordinary people as well, haven't you, in terms of applying your ways of doing things, ways of bouncing back. Yeah, I mean, what's really um, good, what I have enjoyed about the work is that we've had a really good cross-section. I've had an opportunity to work with heads of states, to work with CEOs, to work with celebrities, and work with a whole host of, uh, you know, everyday people that just have issues that come up in their lives. So how how have you Life is complicated, right? And and I'm assuming that you won't be able to talk to me about any of the people you've worked with. So there's no point asking you about George Bush and Monica Lewinsky and all those things. I got nothing Because your job is not to tell me the truth about all of those things. Um, But, I mean, how how have you got there is the question. I mean, where did you come from? What was your childhood? Oh, childhood. Um, Let's see. Um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., family of five. And, um, you know, very, uh, very uh, tight-knit. Um, it was interesting for, for me because we, uh, grew up, um, in a situation where we didn't have a lot, right? And so, um, I just remember my, um, uh, parents one time, I said that I needed a pair of tennis shoes, right? And so, of course, I wanted, I don't know, something, some big, you know, designer at the time, uh, tennis shoe. And they said, oh, we can't afford that. And I said, Oh, okay. I was really crushed. And I said, well, that's okay. I I don't, I'm just going to save up my money until I can get that shoe, whatever that was. But um, they really just, um, growing up poor really helped. I mean, I remember when um, my mom would take me uh, with her uh, after work. She had two jobs, three actually. And she would take me after work and I would help her clean toilets. Uh, in, the, in at night, and I would say, oh, my God, why do I have to go clean toilets? You know, nobody else at school does that. Never said that again to her in my entire life. Got straight very, uh, very quickly on that, very quickly on How that. did she set you straight on that? Um, because early on, it is not about what um, other people do or what other people are. It is about who you are and what's uh, important. Right. And um, for her, uh, doing what she did each day of her life, it is the work that she does. It doesn't define what her core values are as a person. And um, also taught me as well is that, you know, people put out perceptions, but oftentimes, as we know in our business, it is not the reality. And so um, I learned a lot from my parents, you know, the value of honesty and integrity and uh, hard work. And um, it shouldn't be judged on the kind of work that you do, um, but how you do your work. And you were in Washington, D.C. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Went to um, school in um, Washington, D.C. Went to uh, a Catholic school growing up. I saw one of my... uh, teachers a, a while back and I had said it's like th- you are responsible for me not wearing plaid like you will never see me in blue plaid burgundy plaid because you know I wore uniforms all by uh, you know all my life until I got to 12th grade. So what, what was yeah. Washington like then when you were growing up 
I guess, in the very, 60s, very 70s. Very different than now. Yes, very different than now. Um, it had a reputation as a city. It was, you know, yeah. it was a lot more dangerous and a lot more crime-ridden and a lot poorer yes, yes, than no. it is today. Yeah, it, it was. It was, for sure, for sure. Um, I also think, too, that... Um, you know, just given where we are as a as a, a country, I think Washington, but just across the board, just feels more uh, polarized, right? More divisive than than ever. Um, and it certainly wasn't, you know, like that. Uh, you know, growing up, I remember when um, you could just, you know, you can run outside. Other kids come out and you play. You didn't have a sense of oh, I can't play with that person because they look like this or, you know, their status in life is their, this or their religion is that. And, and I just think in the time and place that we um, are in that it feels like there's so much that divide us instead of unite us. You think that is all happening now, do you? That, that kids growing up today in those areas don't feel as free as you did. Oh, yeah. I mean, no. I mean, just think about basic stuff. We were laughing about this the other day at uh, at work. When I was growing up, there was no such thing as scheduling a play date, <laughs> right? I mean, I get it. Everybody schedules and people are far out, and so you have to, um, you have to do that. But I remember uh, this was actually a, a, a few months ago. Uh, we were at a family dinner, and— um, one of my little nieces and uh, nephews, about nine, uh, was talking about a, a kid who um, was teased at school uh, because she was Muslim and the kinds of clothes that she was wearing at school. That, that never happened when we were growing up. And why do you think it's happened now? Um, I think, you know, it's, it, there's so much going on in the, in, in the country. I think there's... Um, more uh, and more uh, talk that I think uh, in, incites it and uh, says that it's okay. This was actually on local news um, in Washington. There, um, I think there, um, I can't remember the store, but there was a line, let's say it was the supermarket, right? A woman was in the supermarket and was buying groceries and another woman was behind her. And I guess the woman wasn't moving her cart up fast enough. And this woman behind her ran the grocery cart into her, her body, and um, pushed her. And, and pe people were just like, what happened? And the woman just burst out and said, uh, you need to go back to your country. You shouldn't be here anyway. Go buy groceries some other place. Because she wasn't moving her cart fast enough to move up to pay the bill at the cashier. I mean, I never experienced any of that when I was a child. But how, so how, how uh, conscious were you of being a black family? You know, how, how, how much was that part of your identity? Well, we grew, I mean, it's, it's a part of who I am. Obviously, uh, No yeah. doubt, yes. And, um, you know, it's something I'm very proud of. Um, it was never, uh, never part of it in the uh, a sense that I experienced, you know, what this woman experienced in the, you know, in the in the grocery store. Were you brought up to think that there would be obstacles in your life because you were black? I was brought up to think that uh, I am smart and uh, uh, capable and can handle anything, and that you should base it on that, right, and and not base it on outer things. Now, if you're saying um, that, you know, as we go through the world, you know, being an African-American woman is, it's, it's who I am. It's certainly part of my identity for sure. Yeah. But you, so you, you grew up, you know, in a, in a modest home in, yeah. in Washington. Yeah. Were you aware that, you know, of this other side of Washington that you would eventually go and work in the White House, the center of power? Um, uh, you know, what was the gap between that and where you well, yeah, I mean, I was aware of it, but honestly, I didn't really think about it. I remember when I went to go work uh, at the White House for, for President Bush, right? And uh, I remember um, talking at first to the, to the, you know, the original person who was interviewing him, and I said, so you guys don't, you, I want to make sure that you guys understand this. There's a lot of Smiths. Maybe you got the wrong Smith. 
you know that we have no money. Uh, I didn't give to anybody. I actually don't know anybody in the in the in the White House. And um, they were all very clear on that, right? And um, what was very interesting about it was the answer was, yes, no, we understand that. Uh, you're good at what you do, so we want you to come in for an interview. Because you went into the press. Yeah, I was the uh, was president's uh, deputy press secretary. Yeah. And, and so how did you get that job? Did you apply for it? Were you, were you approached? I didn't. Or? I didn't. I mean, that's why, you know, my, my kids, I'm sure, are probably sick of hearing this. But there is some, for me anyway, I've learned this, um, value in um, just doing the work and working, working hard and, and, and concentrating on that so that you develop an expertise and you feel good about what you do and you are competent and you're really, really um, good at it. And so um, how I got the job at the White House was they received four recommendations. They called them and said, hey, I'm looking for a deputy press secretary who you think is good. And so the, the same four people gave my name. And it wasn't, I had no connections at the White House. I mean, think about it. What are the odds of a poor African-American girl from Northeast Washington, D.C. going to work in the White House, right? And so... So what um, were you doing at that time? Prior to the White House, I worked at the U.S. Attorney's Office. Um, and I was a former prosecutor and did, you know, legal work and communications work. And then after that, um, went to go work um, with the Iran-Contra investigation. Uh, President Reagan uh, was exchanging arms for hostages, and um, uh, and worked on and and worked on that. And so, actually, when I was at the U.S. Attorney's office, uh, was working on a um, case and got a call and said, "Would you be interested in coming over to the White House and and?" talking about working in the White House. And honestly, I thought it was a joke when I got the call because I have a, a good friend and I thought that she was playing a prank on me. When somebody called from the White House and said, oh, we want you to come in and talk to the president about, you know, working, you know, as deputy press secretary, I'm like, oh, sure you do, sure you do. And I hung the phone up, right? Because I thought it was a jo joke and they had called back and said the same thing. I said, well, if this is really the White House, tell me what the Oval looks like, which was the dumbest thing in the world, right? Because you can see it on TV. And then I felt incredibly stupid. And um, I uh, went in for an interview. And actually, I didn't think I got the job because, you know, it was a very um, frank discussion about policies and practices and that kind of stuff. And uh, called me back the next day and interviewed with the president, and he said, what are you doing the rest of the day? And I was like, uh, nothing, sir. And um, he said, come go with me. And we walked through the, at the door in the South, South Lawn and jumped into um, uh, Marine One and then from Air Force One. And, you know, I was, of course, trying not to have a panic attack, like, oh, my God, I'm going to Marine One. Oh, no, I'm on Air Force One. Ah! Um, and we just talked the whole time. It didn't have anything to do with um, policies and any of that. It was just a conversation about life and what do you care about and, um, you know, how you grew up and what do you want to do. That was it. And by the time we got back to the White House at 10 or 11 o'clock that night, he said, I want to hire her. That is how I got the job at the White House. So, so were you political at all? I mean, were you even a Republican? No, I'm not. I'm really, anybody who tells you who knows me knows that I am really not a political uh, uh, person. And it wasn't, it was not uh, based on uh, politics, which is I go back to my theme of working hard and doing a good job. It was totally based on, totally based on that. And the thing I would also say, and you, you'll understand this, is people should not be afraid to take a risk. Because I can't really say that my life has been some big strategy or plan. Um, but um, how I got the job uh, with the pres President Reagan, the independent counsel, the investigation, was I was actually all set to go take another job in New York. I had 
signed the agreement. I had an apartment. I was supposed to go in two days, and I just happened to meet a buddy of mine for lunch who worked at the Iran-Contra investigation. So, I mean, this was an incredible insight, both into how corporate and um, official America works, yes, and also the terrible things governments and militaries will do <laughs> in the name of democracy. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the terribly yes. scandalous things yes. that they will do. Yes. So were you shocked? Um, yes. I mean, you know, I was, what, what, the, what the American government or what the American military was prepared to do or what Oliver North was prepared to well, do. Well, sure, sure. I mean, and for me, I was shocked by two things. One, how quickly you have sorted out a path and how that can take a turn in a second, right? I was ready to move to New York on Tuesday, but all of a sudden on Monday, this completely different thing happened, right? So that's one shock. I mean, yes, the... The second shock was, you know, uh, being involved. I mean, you would never think something like that would happen, but it did. And so having an opportunity, um, I feel very lucky about this, of uh, being able to be a part of or, you know, having witnessed some of the key moments in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in American history. So it didn't put you off government is, is, is what, what's interesting. You, know, you didn't look at this and go, my God, this is an awful corrupt, you know, no. business and I want nothing to do with it. No, no, it didn't put me off government. I mean, it happened, right? I mean, that's one, one, there's so many lessons from doing crisis, right? And one of them is the facts are the facts. And, and so um, it didn't put me off government because it's just like with the world in which we find ourselves and we live in, right? there great, wonderful people, they're nice, kind people, and, you know, sometimes they're, they're you know, mean people and not so nice people. So it's, a, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I mean, you have to work for them, don't you? I mean, you have to represent them, mean people as well. Not if I don't want to. No? No, I mean, that for me is one of the things uh, about, uh, I would say, living free, which is uh, what I try to do every single day, is, um, you know, having your own firm, uh, it, it, it's it's more difficult for sure than uh, working um, working for a firm, but really there's a sense of freedom, right? Because you really get to weigh and decide the kinds of things that you want to do and the kinds of things that you want to be involved in. But in public relations system. in general, I suppose, yeah. is what I mean. You know, yeah. you know, I think most people think of public relations as a sort of a combination of things, but one yeah. of them is you know, helping bad people get away with stuff. But see, I don't know why people think that, right? It's not really helping. First of all, communications is a wide field, right? I mean, we need to put that into, into context. But oftentimes, right, let's say if there's a, there's a crisis, right? There's, you know, somebody did something that they wish they had not done. Part of that, um, and I think a big part is that when you are trying to explain to um, the American public, there are several things that just don't change, right? Is that if you have made a mistake, you have to take ownership for it, right? So for whatever that mistake was, you know, if you are a CEO and um, the chief financial officer, I don't know, you know, misappropriated funds, right? That financial officer has to come clean and has to say, this is what occurred, this is what happened, and take ownership and responsibility, and so does that CEO. And so for me, that's, that's what that communication is about, not trying to uh, duck and dodge anything. Here's what I have learned in communications, one of the many things is, um, and I have to laugh because my mom and dad used to say this when I was growing up, and you know how you grow up and you say, oh, you're not going to say that, your parents said that. But they always used to say, if they said, oh, um, I said, no, no, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. I was just around the corner playing with Jeannie. We were playing a game. And, you know, I could have been around the corner with, you know, Joe when I was 13, you know, a, a boy or something. And my parents used to always say, well, Judy, if you don't tell the truth, you know the truth is going to come out. It's just a question of when. It is the exact same thing that I tell my clients. The exact same thing because it is. It is. And so, you know, why not 
as you should, just face into it and call it what it is. Do you think the truth does always come out? I do. It's a question of when. It does. Think about how many times if you just even use history or people's lives, right, when they have uh, tried to um, cover up something, as you say, right, or uh, or hide something. It does come out, right? I mean, this is—I don't know why this just popped up in my mind, but— um, Senator Edwards, who ran for president, right? And do you remember it was a situation where he didn't have a relationship? I think his wife was um, dying of cancer at the time. And um, it was a story that appeared in one of the local publications in the States and totally denied it, totally denied it. And I think a colleague close to him took responsibility and said, no, you know, that wasn't him, that was me and all of that. But it came out. It just, it always does. And by the way, too, who would want to live with those, all of those things that you are trying to hide and conceal? So, so when somebody comes to you now yeah. with a crisis, mm-hmm. something, something terrible is about to break, one yeah. is breaking, and they yeah. don't know how to handle it, mm-hmm. do, you, do you ask them for what the truth is? Oh, sure. Do you, you, know do you why? say, tell me everything? Yes. You know or, why? Because you can't have a strategy or a plan unless you know the truth, right? So if I come out... Um, and, and they tell you, do they? Yeah. Well, yeah, if they want my help, they do, <laughs> right? Because think about it. If I know um, all of the facts, you can map out a strategy and a plan and you can execute it on on it, right? And also, it defines what you're going to say about it. What's the messaging? If I'm going out saying this is absolutely not uh, true, our chief financial officer um, did not take that money, right? Now, if there's some fact that I don't know about that say, well, maybe he didn't do it that time, but actually there were three other times that we put him on probation because we thought that he took money, right? Or we're still investigating whether he did take the money. We haven't completed it yet. So why would I go out and say, right, that he that he didn't do it and I don't know all the facts? The facts are really critical, really do you, critical. Do you think the rules, though, are changing, if you like? I mean, the need yeah. to tell the truth. Has Donald Trump changed the rules and, and the way PR works? Well, well, I know. I think the truth is always important, right? It, 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 it is always important. When you look at the kinds of issues that arise when you're not truthful, I think it's better to, to, to tell the truth, right? I mean, think about it. Let's, we'll stay on your example. Um, there would not be um, the impeachment proceedings going on now that are taking place if, um, if there was truth. There, there, would not, there would not be that, right? I mean, there was a, there's an investigation that revealed several things, you know, phone calls, records, I mean, all of that. It goes back to proving my point. It just is a question of when truth comes out, but it always does come out. But, I mean, th- there have been so many examples of things that have no, sort of been know. brought up about, you know, about, let's stay with Trump, you yeah, know, about sure. Trump, about his, yeah. his, his post past businesses, all that yes. kind of stuff. And if you just kind of have your alternate truth, <laughs> yeah. as it's been called, yes. and say things... Um, that your supporters will support and believe. Well, some Does, people, you know, has yeah. that changed? You know, are there lessons basically from what, the way he behaves that corporate America and celebrities and everybody else are learning as well? You well, know? yeah. I mean, I think there are lessons sort of across the board because our our culture uh, has changed so much. I mean, social media is one of them, right? I mean, the use of Twitter is a form for him of governing. Right now on social media, um, that's a good example of how it has changed how everybody interacts. Right, so there could be a a, a crisis, and um, it will break in probably. There's a recent uh, study that showed a crisis could break and spread internationally in what 18, 19 seconds. That's that's quick. 
that's quick. And so in our business, there's not a whole lot of time in 19 seconds to let's figure out the facts, let's figure out messaging. I mean, do you generally think social media for leaders is a bad idea? No, no I you, think, you I think it's how you use it. should be in your communication. Yeah, I think it depends on how you use it. For example, there was a, a company um, that apologized on social media, right? The CEO did. Now, the CEO usually uses that vehicle in making his apologies, but when you are posting 12 different posts and you're expecting your um, consumers who buy your products to follow 12 different posts about an apology, that's hard to follow. So I think when people want to communicate a message, that you want to determine what's the best vehicle to communicate that message. So how, how do you think the role of press secretary in the White House is different now to how it was when you were working for Yeah, no, uh, I think Bush. that's a very good question. I think it's changed, uh, I think it's changed an awful lot. Um, you know, when I uh, was uh, doing it, uh, there uh, was a, a, a sense that, you know, that when you're standing up, it's a privilege. You're standing up at the microphone and there's a bank of reporters there, you know, yelling questions at you. And, you know, you're, you're representing the United States. You're representing the president. And um, you want to do the, the very best job that you, the very best job that you can. And speaking the truth about a situation um, is, uh, is, is important. Um, I, I think that the role of it has changed uh, tremendously. Um, I think that uh, oftentimes when you are saying X and it later turns out to be Y, the person speaking that is put in a very bad situation because what you're then doing is you're jeopardizing and uh, putting your own credibility uh, in a very bad situation. Yeah. So you, you couldn't do it now, could oh, you? Oh, I, this, no, but not do it. So, where, so what do you think of the way somebody like Sarah Sanders does it? I mean, she's clearly got a different approach. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I would never want to be in a situation where I am speaking to a reporter, right, which is what, speaking to a reporter, and I'm delivering a message and saying that it's A, based on the information that I received, and it turns out to be Z. You wouldn't, you know, as a communicator, you wouldn't want to be in that situation. I mean, that, that's one thing. I mean, that, yeah. and, and that's a sort of an innocent, yes. um, perhaps a generous interpretation of what's going on. Yes. I mean, you know, the, the question is, do you think people are deliberately lying? Because that's what people think PR is a lot of the time now. Yeah, you know, that but it's, 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 that it's... it's deliberately not telling yes, the Yes, but it's not. It's not. Why do you feel like people think that? Well, because there's so much going on in terms of <laughs> yes, politics yes. and, and, you know, and big corporate scandals. Crisis communications yeah. people. We don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Yeah. But but do you see that that's, that's no, something that's I do, changed? I in this do. I do, and it's disappointing. Yes, of course. You know, there, there are PR people out there oh, who are I willing know to lie. Oh, I it is. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, but you would also say, too, I mean, no, look, there's no defense. You should not lie. I mean, let's just be very uh, unequivocal about that, right? Um, but to your point, you know, there, I'm, there's no doubt there are people in every um, – profession that do things that they should not be doing. Um, but in terms of standards, right, and uh, credibility and how you should conduct yourself, it is, it is not like that. And do you think there are lots of people like you who have worked in government who are shocked now at the way things are conducted? Oh, sure. There are a lot of people that won't go into government now, right? I, I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day and one of the reasons why she was saying that she didn't want to go into government is <laughs> because there's so many crises and so many problems that so many of her friends are incurring legal fees because you have to hire your own attorney when you get, you know, embroiled in an investigation and that sort of thing. And um, it's not as if that, you know, government workers are making tons of money where they can, you know, spend it on legal fees uh, regarding investigations that are going on. So, so what, I mean, if, if we try and apply some of, you know, what, you've, what, what you do professionally yeah. to people's lives, I mean, 
Why do you think telling the truth is the right thing to do, given so many liars seem to do so well, and so many people who tell the truth end up being punished for it? (laughs) But but ultimately, I will tell you this, is that when... um, People don't tell the truth. I do think there's consequences for it, right? You may not feel the immediate consequence like we would want, um, but I do believe that there's consequences for it. I, 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 I can't let go of that. I have, to, I have to hold on to that. Can't let go of that. No. Mm-mm. And, and the truth is important in particular. If, look, if you honestly have... Um, I'm saying had a lapse in judgment or, you know, made a mistake and you made an error and you, you know, you want to apologize for it. Look, hey, I, I screwed up. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. That's what people do. That's what people should do. But do you think, do you think the world is as forgiving now as it used to be? I do. I do. But let me tell you what I think is important, though. I think that the American public can smell bullshit a mile away. Anybody, right? And so things don't, um, p- things don't pass the smell test, right? And so um, because uh, they can smell bullshit, that when you screw up and you make a mistake, they can tell when it's not sincere, when you don't mean it. You can probably think about tonight. You call me. <laughs> you can think about when you've seen somebody on television, right? Right. And you're like, they're sitting across, they're saying they're sorry for something. You can say, oh, God, they don't seem like they're sorry. They're lying. They're not telling the truth, right? Or you feel like someone is is holding. People know that. People instinctively, they can see that. They can know that. So 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 why why when you, when when your period working for George Bush came to an end, Mm -hmm. why did you go into the private sector. Why, why didn't you stay in government? Because you started your own firm then, basically. Yeah, well, yeah, when I um, uh, left the White House, I went to uh, work at NBC a little bit, and then I started my own firm. And it was really, I mean, once again, it was not a big strategy or play at it. I said, I'm going to go do this. Um, and people started to call me and said, hey, um, can you uh, help me with this? And and, and honestly, one of the first um, big clients I did get was um, working with um, uh, with uh, Monica Lewinsky. And, but so it and just from there, it just uh, continued to grow. How did that happen? Grow. Um, I got calls from uh, several people um, to meet and to see if I um, see if I was interested in in helping and. Um, you know, it just uh, it it just took off, and after that, people started to call, and I said, "Oh well, I guess maybe I should get a little place where, in case people want to come by, they could see." And I got a little small office. When you look back at Lewinsky, yeah, and the way she was treated, mm-hmm. particularly by the media, yeah, how, how do you feel? Well, it was it's it was it's totally different. It was very it's it's very interesting, you know, history and. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. I, you know, I remember this was you know two years ago where, um, you know, so many uh, women had uh, come out and you know really uh, uh, apologized for you know treating her in the manner in which um, she was treated. I mean, the culture now is totally different. You look at the you know the Me Too movement and and Times Up and all of that. One, women uh, don't accept. Uh, uh, being treated uh, poorly, right, in, in the workplace, in, you know, relationships across the board. Um, I think our culture has proven that out, that there are certain standards that people have to operate by in the workplace, you know, hence the, you know, sexual assault and uh, sexual harassment and all of those things. There's much more uh, accountability for that. And as you see it and you see where the Me Too movement is going, it doesn't, the accountability is at all, is at all levels. For for many years, you were, you were um, portrayed in a hit American TV series, The Scandal. No, what Um, what show was that? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Oh, was that where I moved dead bodies from crime scenes, that show? What's that like? I mean, you know, when, when they come to you and say, we kind of want to make a TV series based on you. Yeah. 
Well, it was a it was a very interesting journey. Um, first of all, I learned a lot about television. I didn't know uh, how important uh, sex was during the you know nine ten o'clock hour. It's important on television. Um, it was a journey in the sense of this: it uh, allowed people, I think, to get a sense, even though it was television, because it has to be entertaining. Like I'm pretty boring. If you follow me around all day long, you'd be like, "Ah, oh, please cut it. It's boring. We have nothing for tape, right?" Um, but what it did was give people just even a sense that there's there's um, a profession, right? That this is this is work because really before somebody in my office actually looked this up or sent this to me, you know, prior to the show there wasn't a sense of what um, that it was this concept or idea of somebody that you go to, you know, when you have a crisis. Um, but Did you spend me, years saying, no, that didn't really happen? <laughs> so, well, yeah, I mean, I kind of say ahead of time, like, did not have a personal relationship with the president and don't move dead bodies from crime scenes. What I think um, was really good about the show was that you had a strong woman who was playing the lead, who was good at what she did and felt that it was okay to know that she was good at what she did and didn't try to hide it and didn't try to apologize for it, right? So I think that, um, to me, was very uh, critical um, on the show. And the other thing that um, I think really did help open doors on the area of inclusion was, you know, it's the first time that was an African-American woman played lead in television in 35 years. It's kind of hard to believe, but, but that's the truth, yeah. And it allowed my two sons to use the show to try to pick up girls. I later <laughs> found that out, but yes. <laughs> now, you're, you're here because you're actually, you're, you're sort of starting a wing of your business in Britain. Um, we've actually um, done a lot of work in um, London through the, through the years, um, you know, working with corporations, uh, associations, and high-profile individuals and, and um, in the public, experience, public affairs space as well. And so um, what we are, what we have done is um, actually open up an outpost in London, having a London office. So very, very excited about it. I mean, right now, you know, the obvious client everyone will, 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 will be wondering about is, is the royal family. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you think of the way both sides, all sides have handled it? Well, I tell you what's interesting for me, and I will say this about crisis, is that oftentimes I think people forget that at the core of a crisis, it really is about people, right? When you take away all of the perception of who we think they are, who they think they are, who we think they are, I should say. And um, what, when you look at it, it is really uh, Harry and Meghan deciding and making choices about what they think is best for their family. It is the queen, on the other hand, deciding and making choices what she thinks is in the best interest of the crown and also what she thinks is in the, you know, the best interest of her grandson. And so I think with anything for us, when people are making decisions, we always want folks to, I want people to think about the ramifications, um, want people to try to weigh the issues and, um, you know, build um, uh, consensus and understand, too, how things are going to land, right, and how they're going to be uh, perceived. But at its core, it's about, it's about choices and, and making decisions that you think are really best for you. I mean, ha Harry and Meghan's decision seems yeah. at least partly driven on wanting to sort of basically stop interacting with the media to do things on their terms. Do you think it's possible when you are such a high profile figure to basically say, we're not going to cooperate with the media in the old ways anymore. We're going to do it ourselves through social media and you'll get what you're given. Well, I think two things. I think it's possible um, to say that you want to live the life the way that you want to live it. 
right? Now, there are always going to be outside forces um, uh, affecting that, for sure, no doubt. But um, I think on the, on the media side, well, yes, I mean, people are going to cover them. People are going to write stories about them. But it certainly doesn't mean that when people are writing stories about you that you have to grant access Right. But I think really but, but what it's going to make enemies of the media. Have well, we? I think what it's going to take for anybody when you make a change. Right. Um, whether it's the anybody, this could be them. It could be just everyday folks. Right. When you make a change in your life, you've got to figure out how it's going to work out. Right. And you have to feel your way sometimes. You might go right and say, no, that's not really good. You might go left. And you just honestly have to give yourself the space and the time to figure it out. That's what life is supposed to be about. It's not, it is not perfection. Let, it, let us figure it out. Do you think they're being well advised? I would say that the uh, advice and counsel, and I, look, let me just say this first. Um, this is all based on, because I always think that people make these judgments and decisions based on facts that we think we know, and we really may not know all the facts, right, um, here. But um, no, I would say that my uh, judgment and uh, uh, counsel would have been different. I think that, um, I think that sort of people think that, you know, things could have been handled better. I mean, you, you talked through this interview about, you know, your particular philosophy, you know, very much based on telling the truth, confronting things, you know, realities and what you've yeah. done. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, again, in terms of, sort of applying this to the wider world, is this sort of a mission you're on, do you think? I feel in a lot of ways that um, this is my spot. This is what I was meant to do, right? I, I was writing this book and um, my uh, girlfriend called me and I've known, uh, her name is Michelle, I call her Bean here because I've known her since I was four years old, right? And so she called me up and she said, hey, I wanna go out for a drink. Can you go for a glass of wine? Wine and popcorn. And can you go for a glass of wine? And um, I said, I can. I said, I'm you know, writing this book and I gotta figure out how I got started in crisis management, who knows, has been so long ago. And she said, oh, heck, is that all standing in front of us in a glass of wine? I can tell you that. I said, well, tell me. Seven years old, there was a major dodgeball fight in the back alley, and I wasn't even involved in it. And I'm peering through the window looking, and then I rush out, and I say, well, no, we all shouldn't be fighting. We need to talk. We need to work this out. No, that wasn't a foul ball. And, you know, we do that. But what she pointed out to me, because she's known me for so long, she just said that you were just meant to do this. It, it is just evident of every single crisis or problem, Judy, that you've got you, you into. You would manage it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's, it's clear. And, and what has been um, a really gift about it is that you know, you see across the board that people tend to think that, oh, this is different because it's have profile, right? Or, you know, different because they are a celebrity. And the fact of the matter is that when you strip that away and you look at people just as people, it is really the same. It truly is. If you could change the world yes. anyway, with uh, a magic wand, yeah. what would you do? I would probably say that um, that if I could change the world, I would hope that people would try to see things through um, a lens that saw people truly how they are. Judy Smith, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. For coming thank on and sharing so your much. ways to change the world oh. um, and your, your remarkable story. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, then please do give us a rating and a review. You can watch all of these interviews on the Channel 4 News YouTube channel. Our producer is Rachel Evans. Until next time, bye-bye.